Hey everyone, in this tutorial we'll go over making our very own camera shake component in Unity that's animated procedurally using noise. Camera shakes are a great way to add a heavy or impactful and energetic feeling to events in films and interactive media like games based on visual or even sound based events. I've seen some examples where developers will render their screen shakes using random positions for the camera or by using keyframes or even by moving around a final render texture. These are all fine, but we can get a lot more control and a nicer looking end result using procedural animation applied to a transform's position or rotation. Basically, we'll sample a randomly offset point with 2D Perlin in noise for each axis, X, Y, and Z over time, and blend that value in using an adjustable animation curve. We'll be setting up a very versatile event-based system which will allow us to queue and process each screen shake event additively so that each one can have its own settings, blend curves, and whatever else. To do this, we'll store the settings for any given screen shake event into a scriptable object preset so that we can reuse the same settings if we need to and quickly pass that information visually to other standard Unity systems like button click events. I know that to some of you this may sound a bit weird and complex, but it's actually pretty easy and simple to do. I'll also be explaining the concept some more along the way, so let's just get started. The first thing we'll do is create the scriptable object for the shake event presets. We'll call it shake transform event data. And instead of inheriting from mono behavior, we'll inherit from scriptable object. Next, we'll add a create menu asset attribute so that we can control how it shows up in the editor when we want to create a new preset. You can see now in the editor how it shows up if I right click and choose to create it from the context menu, but it's empty. We can start populating it with the data we'll need it to store. Everything will be public so it can automatically be serialized and accessed externally. Let's create a new enum called target and add in two values as position and rotation. This will help us specify whether we want the shake to apply to the position or rotation of the shake transform. Let's create a new variable of type target and set the default value to position. It'll default to position anyways since it's the first value but this way we can be sure and it makes the code easier to follow. We'll create two floats to determine the amplitude and frequency, which will default to 1. Amplitude is the range of motion for the target axis for position or Euler rotation. It's applied as a multiple to the noise sample. Frequency is the speed or how fast we'll scroll over the Perlin noise. It's applied as a multiple to delta time. Then we have duration, which is just how long the effect will last. And then finally, our last variable will be an animation curve called blend over lifetime, which will attenuate the noise amplitude over a normalized 0 to 1 time range. It'll be used the same way as amplitude, that is, as a multiple to the noise as we evaluate the curve over the lifetime of the effect. We'll set the default as a new animation curve with three keyframes for fading in quickly and then smoothly fading out. Our first keyframe will be at 0 with a value of 0. Our second keyframe will be at 0 0.2 with a value of 1. And our last keyframe will be at 1 with a value of 0. We'll also set up custom tangents for the first keyframe so that the angle of the curve is very steep. The tangents are required to be in radians, so to make it easier to read on our end, we'll multiply them by mathf.deg2rad. This will convert the value initially interpreted as degrees to radians. We can leave the first incoming tangent at 0, but the second one will set to 720. Let's go back to the editor so we can see what that looks like. You can see the default values on the animation curve, and I think this is good for blending most shake effects very smoothly. Over the lifetime of the effect, which is determined by duration, it'll quickly fade in to the maximum amplitude supplied at around 20%, then ease out. Finally, we also want an initialization function, which we can just call init. This isn't something you need for scriptable objects, but we'll be instancing this type at runtime later, so this function will come in handy then. Now we can get to the meat of the implementation. Let's create a new script called shake transform. We'll create a new public class inside of this called shake event. The shake transform script will manage these events as they're added to a list, which we can create now. We'll just call it shake events. Now let's go back and fill out the class we just created. We'll need two floats for duration and time remaining. This will allow us to keep track of the lifetime and normalize it for blending later. We also need to store the shake transform event data, which this event is based off, so we can read in the values and use them. So let's create that variable and just call it data. Next, I know later on we'll be interpreting the target for either position or rotation, so I'll need to be able to read that variable from data. 
There's different ways to do this, like simply keeping the data variable public for direct access or creating a new standalone variable for target. But in this case, I'll stick to keeping the data encapsulated and just create a property with a getter. So just make a public variable as you would normally and then define a get which returns data.target. The next variable will be a vector3 for the noise offset. This is the offset for each axis x, y, and z so that we can scroll through the noise over time. If this was a texture, just imagine this as the UV coordinates for each axis, except that we can ignore you scrolling V, so we only need to store a single float for each axis coordinate. We also want a public vector 3 for noise, which will store the actual XYZ value we'll apply to the transform to give it motion. I realize I'm being a little bit inconsistent with what can be written to, considering that I just created a restricted property earlier, but it doesn't really matter. Let's create a constructor for this class, which can initialize itself from a single scriptable object, which stores the event data. We'll set this.data to data, duration to data.duration, and time remaining to duration since it will have its full lifetime at the start. We'll also want to make sure that we scramble the start coordinates so that we don't get the same animation sample from the Perlin noise for every event. This can easily be done with an arbitrary random value range applied to noise offset in the constructor. We'll just use 32. It should be big enough that we won't notice any repetition or similarities. Next, we want a public update function which we can call in the actual shake transform mono behavior update callback for each event. This will drive the shake event noise one time step forward each time it's called. We'll store the delta time in a float for easy access and then subtract that from the time remaining. We'll create a variable for the change to noise offset as noise offset delta and change that to delta time times the data dot frequency. Depending on if the frequency is greater than or less than 1, the scrolling will either be faster or slower. Now we just need to add the delta to the actual offset. We'll do this per axis because in this case I think it's easier to understand. Then we'll set the value for the noise on each axis by using mathf.perlinnoise. We'll pass in the appropriate noise offset depending on the axis, x, y, and z, and set some constants for the y coordinates. At this point, we have some noisy motion stored in the variable, but it's not centered since all the values will be positive from 0 to 1. We can just subtract 0 0.5 from the vector to remap it to negative 0.5 to 0.5. This way, the absolute range still remains 1. Let's scale the noise by the amplitude by multiplying it. Now all we need to do is determine the blending. Let's create a float to store the normalized time elapsed as age percent. This will just go from 0 to 1 as the shake event nears its duration. We can get this as the inverse of the time remaining over duration and subtracting that from 1. Finally, we'll attenuate the noise by evaluating the blend over lifetime curve and passing an age percent as the time or x coordinate of the curve. That wraps up the update function. I'll just create another convenience function as a public bool that I can use to check if the event is still within its duration. I'll call it isAlive, and all it does is return the evaluation of time remaining is greater than zero. And that's it for the shake event, we're almost done. Going back to the shake transform mono behavior, we'll throw in two public void methods for adding a shake event, simply called add shake event. The first one will just take in a scriptable object for the data required, and the second will allow us to pass in each variable individually. If using the first function, it's as simple as adding a new shake event to the shake events list. If using the second function, we'll need to create a new instance of the data, then initialize it with the parameters. Then we can call the first function with the runtime scriptable object we created. 
We're at the last part now, so just hang in there. After all this, we need to process the events that will be added to the list. We'll handle this in late updates so other scripts can use update to add in these events and we can process them in bulk correctly for the current frame. We'll create two vector 3s for the position and rotation offsets. We'll initialize both to 0. As we loop through the list, we'll add the noise extracted from each active event and add them to the appropriate offset. Let's make our for loop, which will iterate backwards from the end of the list down to the first event. So, starting with int i equals shake event dot count minus 1, while i does not equal 1, i minus minus. The reason I'm iterating over the list backwards is that so I can safely remove any dead shake events I encountered with expired durations. If I'm going backwards to zero, I have a constant target index, but if I was to move forward, the length of the list would change as I removed events, and that could cause problems. I'll just create a new shake event variable so I can quickly reference the event in the list as the current index. We can call it se for shake event. And then I'll update se. Since it's a class, it's by reference, and it'll automatically change whatever's in the list. I can now go ahead and process the event, but I need to make sure that I add the noise to the correct target. For that, I'll just check if target equals position, and if it does, I can add it to the position offset. Else, I'll add it to the rotation. At this point, if SE isn't alive, I can remove it by index. Finally, let's set the local position and Euler angles of the transform to the offsets we just calculated so that our motion will actually move the game object. And we're done. Our shake transform system is complete and ready for game implementation. Let's go over how we can use it. The most important element of this system is the camera rig. In this case, I've got an example where I have the move camera game object, which actually has the camera controller, which I can use to move around the level. Underneath that, I have the camera shake game object, which doesn't have anything on it yet, and then I have the camera itself. Because the offset is applied locally, I can just go ahead and add the shake transform to this object, and any shakes or offsets will be applied only to this transform here locally. Let's quickly go over how we can use this system with Unity's UI. Let's create a new button and add a new event. Pass in the camera shake game object, select the shake transform script, and add shake event. You can go ahead and create a new custom shake transform event, give it whatever values you want, and then pass it in. Like this. And now that if I click this, you can see it actually shakes the screen independently of the move. Using the system through code is also really easy. Here I've got a new game object called ShakeOnKey with the ShakeOnKey script component that I just created. All I really need to do to be able to use this through code is create a new shake transform reference, maybe call it st, and then if I want to be able to do it on key, I can do input.getKey down, let's say keycode.space, so every time I press the spacebar, It'll do st add shake event. I can use one of the two overloads, either the one where I pass in the shake transform event data or where I pass in each value individually. In this case, what I'll do is I'll actually just create a new shake transform event data reference, which I can use. So I can just call this data and then pass this in to execute every single time I press space. Let's save that, go back to Unity and hit play and see what happens. So make sure to assign the reference, which will be the camera shake or the shake transform. And for data, let's just pass in one of these, this one right here. And now every time I press spacebar, you can see it works like it should. Another way to do this is instead of keeping a specific reference here, I can also just do camera.main.get component in parent shake transform. And the reason why this will work is because here I've got the main camera and in its parent, I actually have the shake transform on the camera shake game object. So this is also good. And in this, this way, I don't actually need to keep a reference to ST or the shake transform. And you know, it works the exact same way. Another thing I can do is either pass in the values individually or override the values specifically. So in the case of my other script here, shake on collision enter, I have a prefab in my project called sphere, which has the shake on collision enter. And I'm actually calling this function, as you can see, 
camera.main.get component parent shake transform add shake event in on collision enter. So every time the little sphere hits something, you can see it causes the screen to shake. And also when they're destroyed after about, I think, five seconds, they also shake the screen on destroy. Now in this case, it's interesting because for this, I'm actually using the shake transform event data as a template and then overriding the amplitude by multiplying it by the impact magnitude. So the harder these hit the ground, like here, it's going to hit the train really hard, the larger the shake. So it's soft shake like that or really heavy and pronounced shake if I hold the mouse and have the little sphere bash against the train side hard. Alright everyone, thanks for watching. Please leave a comment and subscribe and let me know what you think. See you guys next time. Bye.